Welcome to the next session on module 4 that is desalination of water. What do you mean by desalination? Desalination means the process of removal of dissolved salts present in water. It is termed desalination of water and it can be achieved by reverse osmosis method. So before going to reverse osmosis, first let us see what is osmosis. Osmosis means it is a natural phenomenon in which solvent or water molecules move from dilute solution to concentrated solution through a semi-permeable membrane. So here you can see concentrated sugar solution is taken on one side of the semi-permeable membrane and on the other side it is a dilute sugar solution when osmosis takes place. You can see the water molecules, it is in blue color whereas the violet color it represents the sugar molecules. So after osmosis what happens in the dilute sugar solution part you can see there is a decrease in level of water because the water molecules they have moved towards the concentrated solution. Here after osmosis we can see that more number of water molecules it is there in the concentrated solution. So this process whereby water molecules they move from dilute solution to concentrated solution through a semi permeable membrane. That process it is known as osmosis and the minimum pressure that has to be applied on this membrane to prevent osmosis it is called osmotic pressure. A semi permeable membrane it is nothing but it will allow only movement of certain selected ions or molecules through it. Such type of membrane it is called a semi permeable membrane. So the minimum pressure which has to be applied on the membrane to prevent osmosis it is called osmotic pressure. Now let us come to reverse osmosis. So reverse osmosis means it will be just opposite to osmosis. That means here the water molecules they will be moving in the reverse direction. That is from concentrated solution to dilute solution. So we can define reverse osmosis as the process in which the water molecules are made to move in reverse direction that is from concentrated solution to dilute solution through a semi permeable membrane by applying pressure greater than osmotic pressure. Here this is not a natural phenomenon. Osmosis it is a natural phenomenon whereas reverse osmosis it is not a natural phenomenon. So for reverse osmosis to happen we have to apply pressure greater than osmotic pressure. And reverse osmosis it is used to convert seawater into portable water or drinking water. So reverse osmosis it is used in the water filter units. Now let us see the process. Here brackish water or sea water. Sea water means it will be having higher concentration of dissolved salts in it. Okay. So sea water and pure water they are separated by a semi permeable membrane and the semi permeable membrane it is usually made up of cellulose acetate or polymethacrylate or polyamides. Okay. Now the salt water sea water and the pure water they are separated by a semi permeable membrane and there is a pressure pump that is attached to the sea water. Okay. So when the pressure greater than osmotic pressure when it is applied what happens water molecules present in the sea water they will move through the semi permeable membrane to pure water. Because here the concentration it is high whereas here it is of lower concentration. So by the application of pressure greater than osmotic pressure water molecules they are forced to move from a region of higher concentration to a region of lower concentration that is reverse osmosis will be taking place. And here you can collect the RO water and the water that is uh, 
after osmosis the sea water that is the water which is having higher concentration of salts that can be pumped to the rejection stream okay so this is the reverse osmosis process that is taking place and this is the ro unit now next is determination of fluoride by spa dns method see fluoride ions it will be present in water because the significant sources of fluorides are natural deposits then fluorides they are found in coke in glass and ceramic steel and aluminium processing and electroplating industries from all these sources fluoride ions will enter into water so water it will have fluoride ion concentration low concentration of fluoride it provide protection against tooth decay but if the fluoride ion concentration if it is more it can have an adverse effect on tooth enamel and can give rise to dental fluorosis and elevated fluoride intake can also cause serious effects on your skeletal tissues and according to world health organization permissible level of fluoride in drinking water it is about 1.5 parts per million or 1.5 ppm that is the permissible level of fluoride in drinking water so to determine the amount of fluoride that is present in drinking water we can make use of this method that is spa dns method the principle is the fluoride ions which are present in water it will react with zirconium dyes such as zirconyl spa dns to form colorless complex and an another dye the dye becomes lighter as the fluoride concentration increases so zirconyl spa dns it is having a red color so when this water sample when it is treated with zirconyl spa dns the fluoride ions present in water it will react with this dye to form a complex hexafluoride complex and spa dns which is having an yellow color and the intensity of color the dye becomes lighter as the fluoride concentration increases now let us see the procedure first you have to prepare some standard solutions of fluoride here we have taken sodium fluoride so you can take 500 ml standard flask to each of these flask you will be adding 0.5 mg 1 mg 1.5 mg 2 mg and 2.5 mg of sodium fluoride accurately weighed sodium fluoride it is transferred into these 100 ml standard flask or volumetric flask now to each of these flask you will be adding 10 ml of zirconyl spa dns reagent and a drop of sodium arsenite the sodium arsenite it is added so as to prevent the bleaching action of chloride ions because chloride ions also will be present in water so to prevent the bleaching action of chloride ion we are adding a drop of sodium arsenite now the solution it is made up to the mark with distilled water shake well and keep so this is your standard solutions now a blank solution is prepared by adding 10 ml of zirconyl spa dns reagent and a drop of sodium arsenite into 100 ml volumetric flask and make it up to the mark with distilled water blank solution it is always prepared without the analyte sample now you have to prepare the test solution for test solution the given test sample that will be transferred into the 100 ml volumetric flask to that you will be adding 10 ml of zirconyl spa dns reagent and a drop of sodium arsenite and then dilute the solution to 100 ml using distilled water and shake well so all the solutions are ready so you have prepared your standard solutions you have prepared the blank solution and also the test solution now this method it is based on colorimetry colorimetry it is a 
instrumental method of analysis which is used for colored solutions. The color intensity it is directly proportional to concentration of the solution. Now colorimetry instrumentation it is based on Beer Lambert's law. According to Beer Lambert's law, when monochromatic light is passed through a solution, part of light is absorbed by the solution. Extent of absorption, it depends upon the concentration of the solution and path length of the light through the solution. And it is given by the expression A is equal to epsilon C into T, where A is the absorbance, C it is concentration of the solution and T it is path length. Epsilon it is a coefficient that is molar absorption coefficient. Now here this is the sample cell or the cuvette in which the sample solution will be taken to be placed into the colorimeter instrument. Now as per Beer Lambert's law A is equal to epsilon C into T epsilon it is a constant that means A it is directly proportional to C and T that means absorbance it is directly proportional to concentration of the solution as well as path length. Here path length it remains the constant that is T it remains a constant because we will be using the same cuvette or same sample cell for all the solutions for taking test solutions, blank solution as well as standard solutions we will be using the same cuvette or same sample cell. So the path length that is this distance through which the light passes this is called path length. So path length it remains the same. So this will remain constant. Epsilon is also a constant that means absorbance it is directly proportional to concentration of the solution. That means as the concentration increases absorbance also should increase. Now as per Beer Lambert's law when monochromatic light what do you mean by monochromatic light? Monochromatic light means light of single wavelength. So light of single wavelength when it is passed through a solution part of light it will be absorbed by the solution and the remaining part it will be transmitted. So extent of absorption will depend upon the concentration of the solution and path length. Here path length it is constant because we are taking the same cuvette or same sample cell for all the solutions. Now first we will this is the colorimeter instrument. So first Using the blank solution, set absorbance to 0 at 570 nanometer in the colorimeter. So here the monochromatic light it is used, it is of wavelength 570 nanometer. For this experiment, the wavelength it is 570 nanometer. So here using the knob, we will set the wavelength to 570 nanometers. Then we will take the blank solution in this sample cell or cuvette. In this we will take the blank solution. We will place the blank solution in the colorimeter and then using the knob we will adjust the absorbance to zero. Now you will discard the blank solution and then you will take the standard and the test samples. First you have prepared five standard solutions. So each of these standard solutions you will take in the cuvette one by one and you will note down the absorbance. Then you, after finishing the standard samples you will take the test sample test solution which you have prepared. That test solution also will be taken in the cuvette and then you will read out the absorbance. And now a graph is plotted with absorbance along the y-axis and the volume of NaF here the weight of NaF along the x-axis. And then you will be getting a straight line passing through the origin. It shows that as the concentration of sodium fluoride as it increases absorbance value increases that is why and when the concentration of fluoride when it is zero absorbance will be zero that is why you are getting a straight line passing through the origin. Now this represents the absorbance of the test solution or the sample solution whose fluoride ion concentration has to be determined. So this represents the test solution. Now absorbance of the test solution corresponding to the that value 
you will get the volume of NAF corresponding to the absorbance will give you the amount of fluoride ion that is present in the sample given to you. So the, by this method we can determine the amount of fluoride that is present in the given water sample. So this method is called the determination of fluoride by SPA DNS method. Now next is determination of sulfide ion, sulfate ions by gravimetry method. Now sulfates naturally occur as a result of leaching from sulfur deposits in the earth and they are normally present at some level in all private water systems. So determination of sulfates in water it is done by gravimetric procedure. So gravimetric analysis means it is a technique in which the amount of analyte that means amount of chemical component to be found to be analyzed in a sample is determined by converting or precipitating it into some product. That method it is called gravimetric analysis. Now principle is sulfate ions in the water sample they will react with barium chloride under acidic conditions to give barium sulfate precipitate. By knowing the weight of barium sulfate amount of sulfate ion can be determined. So here acidic conditions are used because water sample will have not only sulfate ions but it will have chloride ions, carbonates, bicarbonates etc. Phosphates all these will be present in water sample. So we are using acidic conditions because upon addition of barium chloride only barium sulfate should get precipitated. If the acid is not added along with barium sulfate, barium carbonate, barium phosphate all will get precipitated and it becomes difficult to find out the sulfate ion concentration alone it becomes difficult to determine. So we make use of acidic conditions so that, so that only barium sulfate alone gets precipitated. Now let us see the procedure. 100 ml of water it is taken in a beaker. To that one test tube of concentrated hydrochloric acid is added and the solution is heated to boiling. Warm solution of 5% barium chloride is added drop wise with constant stirring. So when barium chloride is ha added what happens the sulfate ions that is present in this 100 ml of water how much sulfate ions are present they will react with barium chloride and form barium sulfate precipitate. So white precipitate of barium sulfate formed it is kept in hot water bath for about 45 minutes so that complete precipitation takes place whatever sulfate that is present in 100 ml of water sample it will get precipitated as barium sulfate and then after 45 minutes it is allowed to cool. And then the solution with the precipitate it is filtered through a Wattman filter paper. Wattman filter paper means it is a standard grade filter paper for clarification of liquids. Okay, so all the precipitate it will be retained in the filter paper. Now weigh out a dry crucible. Let the weight of the crucible be W1 grams. Now transfer the filter paper containing barium sulfate precipitate into the previously weighed crucible into the previously weighed crucible. Now the crucible it is the paper it is burnt off in an electric burner. You will place the crucible in the electric burner whereby the filter paper it will be burnt off and now transfer the crucible into a desiccator for cooling. After cooling you will note down the weight of the crucible containing barium sulfate. Now the weight of crucible along with barium sulfate precipitate let it be W2 grams. The difference in weight that is W2 minus W1. W2 is barium sulfate plus crucible and W1 is the weight of crucible alone. So this difference it will give you the amount of barium sulfate that is formed. formed. So amount of barium sulfate formed let it be W2 minus W1 that is equal to W3 let it be W3. Now 
233.33 it is the molecular mass of barium sulfate this much barium sulfate gram of barium sulfate contains 96 mg of sulfate ions 96 means this oxygen its atomic mass is 16 so 16 into 4 64 64 plus sulfur its atomic mass is 32 so 64 plus 32 it is 96 so 96 it is the atom uh, this mass of sulfate ion okay and 233.33 is the molecular mass of barium sulfate so this much milligram of barium sulfate contains 96 milligram of sulfate that means w3 gram of barium sulfate this is the weight of precipitate that is obtained so w3 gram of barium sulfate it will contain w3 into 96 divided by 233.33 mg of sulfate ions that means your 100 ml of the water sample it will have this much mg of sulfate because w3 gram of barium sulfate it is obtained from 100 ml of the water sample so if w3 gram of barium sulfate contains so much of sulfate means 100 ml of water water sample will have this much of sulfate so 1 ml of water sample will have this much milligram of sulfate ions for 1 ml it will be divided by 100 therefore 1000 ml of the water sample it will have this much into 1000 milligram of sulfate so this is how we determine the amount of sulfate present in a given water sample gravimetrically okay thank you